Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I'm Ben Spriggs. I'm editor-in-chief of L Decoration magazine. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined today by Lee Broom, um, one of the UK's leading product designers um, who runs, heads up his own eponymous luxury um, global design brand. Um, since founding the company back in 2007, he's created over 100 different furniture, lighting, accessory products, um, and collaborated with the likes of Christian Louboutin, Wedgwood, Mulberry, to name just a few. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to be here. Um, so you obviously started, I would like to take you back to the very beginning, first off. Um, you obviously originally started at drama school, and then I think you won a design, fashion design competition about age 17, and ended up working with Vivian Westwood. Yes. So I just wanted to find out how that was. Who, you know, how did she influence you? What was it like working with her? Yeah, well, my, my plan was to become an actor as an adult. I was already a child actor and a professional one from the age of seven till I was 17. Um, and really, design was more of a, of a hobby. And I was particularly interested in fashion design. Mm. So I entered a competition, which was the Young Designer of the Year Award, which was judged by Vivian Westwood. And I was probably 16 or 17 at the time. And I won the competition. Um, and at the sort of ceremony and fashion show, I got to meet Vivian and uh, actually asked her for her autograph. And um, she wrote a phone number down and oh said, right. why don't you give me a call? You can come to the studio and see how we work. If you're interested in getting into fashion, um, I really think you should see what, what's involved in the process. So I was just like completely gagged because I was a, a huge fan of mm. Vivian Westwood and just like sort of treasured her phone number and then called up. Um, and I went there for a couple of days mm -hmm. initially and really sat with her in her studio, in her office. I was party to all of the meetings that she was having. She taught me through her processes of, um, you know, history of art, history of pattern cutting, taking tradition and bringing it into sort of the modern world, mm. which is something that's kind of stuck with me as a designer mm -hmm. now. Um, so to cut a long story short, I ended up staying there for like 10 months. Right. And I went to Paris and got to dress. Well, it was like the 90s, the mid 90s. Mm. So my job was to dress Kate Moss and look after wow. Naomi Campbell. And it was just like, you know, for a 17 year old in your kind of formative years, it was um, incredible. So. I was decided at that point, I don't want a mm. career in uh, acting, I want to be a fashion designer. Fantastic. Because you obviously, it's interesting these two points, drama and fashion, because these, obviously these influences and these um, feed into your work fr from, the, you know, from the start right through until today. Um, you definitely weave a sense of narrative and drama into your work. And I just wondered how, how you do that, how do you achieve that? I mean, I think that the sort of more dramatic aspect of my work is something that's kind of inherently in me. I don't really um, channel it as such. Mm. I think uh, because I was trained in that art form and I was so young, I think it's instilled in me to a certain extent to see everything that I do, particularly the presentation of what I do as mm -hmm. a performance as such. Yeah. And it is, I mean, if you're, if you're putting something on a plinth or if you're creating a, a show with 30 musicians sitting on your chairs, mm. both of those things are still performances. They are mm. representations of your work. And I see everything, I guess, in a kind of theatrical way. And to a certain extent, sometimes my furniture and even my interiors, I think there has to be you know, a I like that sense of escapism mm -hmm. that you have, yeah. which is particularly prevalent now. Everybody wants to escape from yeah. something. So yeah. it's like, you know, I enjoy that aspect, whether mm. it's nostalgic or whether it's really modern, mm. I think. No, definitely. And in terms of the fashion sense, there's this kind of, you're constantly exploring new themes, but also very much within the overarching house style of Lee Broom, yourself and the brand. Yeah. And it's like, um, you know, how do you do that I mean, in terms of well, making sure it fits what you want? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I would say that that is something that's more purposefully channeled mm -hmm. than, say, my theatre background, which is mm. ingrained. 
and it comes from my training in fashion. So, you know, I, I trained in fashion. I wasn't formally trained in product design or interiors. So I had no point of reference when I mm. became a product designer of, of, in a sense, kind of what I was doing, you mm. know? So I would reference what I did at fashion school and what I learned at Westwood. Mm. So to set up my own brand for a start, at that point, wasn't really common for furniture and lighting designers. Yeah. They were designing for big Italian brands and yeah. sort of doing collaborations. To be an entrepreneur at mm. that point was not very common. I th the only mm. sort of other designer who's British I could think of at that time was maybe Tom Dixon. Mm. Um, but for me, it felt very normal because it's sort of what a fashion brand does. Okay, okay I'm going to yeah. put my name on something and I want to mm. be part of the entire process from yeah. the inception of the design to when it lands in somebody's arms and they yeah. open up the box, yeah. you know, so and see the product for the yeah. first time. So it's like you have from con concept, manufacture, distribution, and then presentation, and like you say, right through to when it enters them. Yeah, and I, I mean, to be fair, I didn't know how challenging that was going <laughs> to be when I started. You mm. know, in retrospect, I sometimes used to think, oh, God, it'd be so much easier just to kind of design for another brand and leave mm. it up to them. But um, I, I am a perfectionist, and I, even mm. if I'm collaborating with other brands, I am still kind of like constantly on the yeah. phone and by email, yeah. what's happening with this, what's happening with that, yeah. how does the box look, mm. you know, how are we going to present it, yeah. you know, I can't just hand things over. No, it's not just like a design and it goes off, You're in, you want to be involved in every aspect. Because I'm used to mm. that, you know, and I guess, um, mm. you know, when it's your name and you are representing the brand, you know, it's it's just so important to get that aspect right, you know, yeah. every aspect. Yeah, completely. And so obviously after the initial kind of start of your career, you did a lot of interior design projects. There mm -hmm. were, I think, m m 40, if not more since then, um, in terms of, and a lot of hospitality, so bar, restaurants. Um, can you give us some highlights from those early days? Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> After leaving fashion school, I wanted to be a fashion designer, um, but I wanted to have my own brand. Mm. I think that was the key uh, thing for me. I wanted to work for myself. Um, and then I, on the side, to kind of make some money while I was at university, mm. I used to sort of go into bars and kind of just sort of like, can I do some upholstery or some paint yeah. effects? Or it was kind of like a sideline and something different from fashion. Mm. And it grew into a small business. Um, and then I partnered with a friend of mine called Mackie, and we ended up setting a company up called Mackie Lee Design. Mm -hmm. And we would design sort of independent bars and restaurants uh, around London and the UK. And it was sort of like my formative years of training in interiors, mm. I guess, because that kind of industry is, it's quite difficult. It's quite sort of cutthroat. It's very fast paced. You've got budgets, mm. the durability of, yeah of everything that you're creating. So it was yeah. a really good training ground mm. for us. And, and time and scales and yeah, demanding and clients, all sorts. Again, when we started, we didn't exactly know what we were doing. But mm. I, I guess, again, it's that thing of not being formally trained in something. Mm. You don't have those restrictions or those boundaries, yeah. you know? So I was of the mindset, OK, if we don't know how to do mm. it, we'll just find out. Mm. How difficult can it be? Yeah. Um, and we did that successfully for a few years. And Mackie decided to move back to Japan and in 2006. In 2007, mm. I launched uh, Lee Broom. Fantastic. And I guess, so like you say, it was that kind of real learning curve of how to run your own business. And also, I within those projects, a lot of that was bespoke product design as well. Yeah, that is really what got me onto sort of doing my own um, collections yeah. because we would often design bespoke items for bars and restaurants that we were creating or for mm. trade shows and and that really kind of allowed me to kind of get in with a network of UK manufacturers mm. who could create furniture and lighting for me. I loved the idea that in our interiors there was a really unique element in there that mm. nobody else had. Um, yeah. And so kind of transitioning then into product design was like a natural thing mm. but in a sense for me it was kind of more like okay well if i'm it's kind of the closest thing i could get to doing fashion in mm. a way mm. not that i wanted to be a fashion designer still but i wanted that idea of creating collections having mm. my own brand presenting yeah. shows and ideas and not just in interiors sure sure um we're actually wa watching some of your products kind of on the slides here and 
was just through a crystal bulb going past. That was obviously one of the pieces that really kind of launched you into the stratosphere, as it were. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that design, how it came about. Well, I'd, I mean, up until that point, I'd been mm. designing quite large scale furniture mm. and some lighting pieces, and they were all kind of fairly expensive. Mm. And I kind of had friends who were just like, oh, I love this, but can't you do something smaller or, mm. or whatever? And I was becoming very fascinated about crystal and cut crystal, um, thinking about my grandparents and sort of crystal decanters and sort yeah. of that kind of thing. And also very much into sort of more industrial design, if you like. Mm. Um, I'd released a product called the Decanter Light at yeah. that point, which was crystal decanters where we'd sort of slice the button bottoms off and we'd made these light fixtures. Yeah. And it sounds really obvious, but nobody had actually done it before. Mm. And we started selling so many of them. Mm -hmm. And they were all vintage uh, at that point. Yeah. And we were sort of literally going to flea markets and guys would come to the studios with sort of like buckets of <laughs> crystals and we'd be sort of like, yeah, yep, we'll have that. No, yeah. we'll take that. And I mean, we were selling so, so many, mm. and eventually we sort of like couldn't keep up. The price of decanters were getting more expensive. Um, and at that point, we started to get stopped by John Lewis, and they wanted us to create the decanter from scratch, yeah. um, which we then did. And so I was just thinking about other, other ideas around crystal and how I could explore. And uh, actually, I dreamt the crystal bulb. I know it <laughs> sounds like ridiculous, no. and I... I often dream about products mm. and sometimes I wake up and I'm just like oh god that was such a load of rubbish but <laughs> in this yeah. case I woke up and I was like oh that's a really good idea mm -hmm. and we had our Milan our first ever Milan show in eight weeks time and um, I said to my partner oh I've got this idea for this product and it's combining an industrial light bulb with sort of cut crystal mm. and he was just like, we've got to do it for Milan. Mm. So we designed it, we did the prototypes, we found the manufacturer, we did the first production run all in eight weeks wow. and presented it in Milan. Mm. And it just became a, a runaway success yeah. from that point. Completely. And so and that I guess that was part, I mean, that's further down the line, but it was part, was there a conscious decision to move away from interior design to product? Or was it just the way it kind of happened? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. At that point, they were kind of on a par, and I was mm. really keen to make a kind of sustainable business out of furniture and lighting, mm -hmm. I think. So, and then it kind of sort of took over, and I still occasionally do interiors now, but mm. not too often. If sure. I'm asked really nicely, I might yeah. do it, or I'll do it for myself. Yes. But um, I don't know, it's, it's just, I guess, again, it's the sort of ultimate thing of being able to be in charge of everything that you're mm. doing. I mean, with an interiors project, you obviously have to deal with the client, yes. um, but which is fine. But I, I just like the idea of creating the products for the space, mm. I think. Yeah. Um, but kind of going back to the crystal bulb, I think that kind of idea for me was creating something that was more tangible for people, mm. but without compromising on any of the craft Not in any sure. way, you know? So it kind of, it moved us into a more sort of public consciousness because yeah. it was a more accessible price product for us, but it was still the most expensive light bulb you're ever gonna buy yeah. and still is probably. Yeah, um, but uh, I think that really changed the business. Mm. I mean, it was, my, my partner always said to me, you know, you need to design a, a, a real classic product, mm. something that everybody can relate to, and mm. that was it. And I think one of the reasons it was so popular is because it has that sense of familiarity about yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say that. It's like you've seen it before, yeah. but not quite yeah. in that way. So people mm. immediately have a connection with it. Mm. It's not like the bleeding edge of sort of design, no. you know? It's not like new materials that you have to get your head around. So yeah. I, I think that's why. Yeah, I think that's like this idea of uniqueness and familiarity kind of just marriage together. And that was a kind of a, a foundation stone of your work that followed, really. Yeah, no, definitely, mm. for sure. This, this idea of taking classic styles and reinterpreting them in contemporary, new, modern ways. Yeah, um, for sure. And that's not an easy thing to do, though. And you know, how, so how how do you do that? How well, if I think about doing it, it doesn't happen. Mm. I mean, it's like got to be a really natural process. Once I start thinking about what I want or what other people mm. want or anything like that, it's kind of game over. Yeah. You know, 
I really just have to explore what I'm obsessed with at that moment mm -hmm. and then take it forward onto the next stage and and then it'll just it'll kind of happen. And I think a lot of it for me as well mm. is to do with stripping back as well. I often design things and then I look at it and then I just remove mm. items to kind of create simplicity. Yeah. Um, sort of like unfussy design in a way. That doesn't mean that it can't be decorative. Yeah, sure. It's just about not over designing things. Mm. So I always say that I when I design something, I then kind of put my contemporary glasses on and just yeah. view it from another angle mm. and just say, is this contemporary? Is it is mm. it relevant? Is it modern? And what kind of inspiration, what what influences do you do you kind of refer to? Can it be anything? What yeah, I mean it's difficult because I it's difficult to answer that question mm. because I've always been creative from a really mm. young child and I I, you know, I sort of feel you could probably lock me in a room with no internet, no TV, n nothing, mm. and I would still probably be able to come up with ideas. It's mm. like I have a, I'm not great with remembering people's names and places yeah. and things like that, but anything visual I can mm. really remember. So I might just walk down the street and see some kind of like element or architectural detail of a building, mm. and then I'll see something else and then just put the two together and then that's it. Mm. And I collect a lot of images and I sketch all the time. Mm. I think, you know, I have loads of sketchbooks and I sketch everything that I yeah. create. I think we've, we've talked before and you said you have these, like you say, the, the sketchbooks that you refer back to and it's interesting that a lot of your products have maybe had iterations a long time before. I know there's a new sofa yeah. in the, that launched this year that was originally, I think, you thought of in 2016 or something. Yeah, you know. yeah, no, exactly. And I, I, even I'm surprised by that. And mm. I sort of look back at things because I might need to for whatever reason. And I saw an iteration of the sofa, yeah, from 2016. Mm. I think sometimes it's about, you know, the right time to release something as mm. well. Yeah. You know, kind of, you know, the idea is, is that you don't want to be too ahead of yourself and you don't want to be too far behind. No. You just want to be at the right point mm. and you want it to make sense. The, the, the way that I can get that right is just kind of think about what I'm doing myself to my own brand. Mm. Does this make sense with in my own brand and as a designer mm. to release this now? Or will, am I, will I look at it or other people look and go, well, hang on, that's a real jump from what we've just seen. Mm. That doesn't make sense. So yeah. there has to be like a, a journey, a flow yeah. to it. Mm, and that's that narrative thing as well that comes through. I yeah, think, yeah, exactly. Kind of I'm sense. better at that now, actually. Mm. When I first started the business, I think that I was really keen to show different sides of myself mm. as a designer. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the design industry is not as fast as fashion. No. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every six months. Mm. Um, it takes longer. So I'm kind of, I have a sort of better groove as far as that's concerned, yeah. I think. Absolutely. And Talk us through the design process a little bit no more. Now you've obviously expanded and you have a bigger studio, you have a bigger team. How does it work in terms of the process of getting to that product? Um, well, like I said before, I mm. still sketch as much as mm. I possibly can, collate lots of images. Mm. Um, we would be working on numerous different products at any time. And then I'll start to think about what could form part of a collection, mm. what's working, yeah. what isn't. Um, once I've designed something, I will then give it to a visualizer and create a sort of 3D visual of the materials, the finish, the luminosity, how it looks. Mm. Um, and I've, I've worked with this person for about just over 10 years. Mm. Um, we've only met once. I love this story. And <laughs> he's visualized every single one mm. of my biggest selling products. It's really weird. I mean, talk about things being virtual now. This was sort of like 10 years ago, and it's like literally he knows kind of what I'm thinking, mm. but I have to be really prescriptive. He doesn't delve into the design thing. I have to be really specific in, in what I want, mm. but we have a very interesting working relationship, and I will create a design. Sometimes it might be very fluid and organic. Mm. Sometimes it's really specific with all the details, the dimensions, how it's put together and then he will visualize it and then we will go back and forward. And sometimes that can go on for years mm -hmm. before I will then show our product development team yeah. of which there's six in that team. And I'll present the products and I'll say, this is what we're gonna be working mm -hmm. on now. And then those guys are brilliant. They, um, 
they then create 3D models, parts of which are 3D printed mm -hmm. or made out of card or various different materials, mm. just so that I can get an idea of the scale of, yeah. of the piece. And then from there, we develop technical drawings and then look at various suppliers. Mm. And for the final pieces, now everything that we do is assembled by us and our factory, which right. we have in East London, mm. um, which is great because it means that the, the mm. quality is there and it means that yeah, it's important to me that people get what they've ordered. Yeah, yeah. completely. And again, you're kind of keeping a, a hand on that, that side of the business as well. Which for is sure, great. yeah. Um, Obviously, luxury is a huge part of the business and what you do. Um, how do you infuse pieces with that sense of luxury, do you think? I mean, luxury has changed over the past 15 years. Mm. That kind of like outward display of affluence is, mm. is not really what luxury is about anymore. Yeah. I think mm. it's about craft, materials, mm. or even the things that you can't see, the things that you hear about, like the narrative of the product, how it was designed, mm. what was the origin around the design. Um, I think that's the most, that's where we get the luxury aspect mm. is with the authenticity. Yep. Um, we don't cut any corners as well. I think that's the thing. I mean, mm. I am a perfectionist and the whole team works in that way as well. We try and elim eliminate every join, every grub screw, every, you know, uh, they get really frustrated with me because they've, mm. you know, created what we want and then I will just delve straight <laughs> into that two millimeter screw and be like that's not right that that needs to go and it's mm. like well we can't make it without that and it was like well that's the point mm. it's like we want people to look at these products and go well how did how did that yeah. happen how is that floating how mm. is that balancing yeah and I think that's where the luxury comes in mm. for us now anyway as, yeah. as a brand and also I guess the importance of the materials you use as well Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's of huge importance. I mm. mean, obviously, we've worked a lot in crystal and we've worked a lot in marble. Mm -hmm. We have like um, a marble grandfather clock, which we make, which I did mm. for our 10 year anniversary. There's only 10 of those. And it's a brutalist sort of grandfather clock. Mm. And when somebody orders that, we fly a member of the team to the quarry in Carrara in yeah. Italy. Yeah. And we will take a photograph of this huge block of marble and we will mark out where the clock is going to be cut from mm. so that the client can see exactly where the vein is going to run across. Wow. And if they wish, they can decide mm. to sort of move that to a different area of mm. the marble. And then we send a master clockmaker out to their home to fit it wherever wow. they are. Mm. I mean, it, we've sold two in Australia, which is really annoying, yeah. but <laughs> you know, so finding somebody there to sort of go out is mm. quite challenging, but that's also part of the luxury as well. You have the materiality, which yeah. you talk about, yeah. and then you've actually got the experience. Mm. If you're gonna invest in something like this, you've got to remember a wonderful experience of your, mm. of your purchase, I think. No, completely. And I think that's also taught this idea that, that you know, you're constantly innovating and evolving as you as you kind of progress. Um, and that technology is a, is a big part of that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, certainly where I think LEDs are, are concerned, mm. and obviously we specialize in lighting and that, you know, LEDs are, are, are changing so quickly. Um, and we try and make classic products that use very modern LED technology. Mm. And a lot of it is integrated, so you can't see the light source. Yeah. You have to think about how the client is able to change that in 10, 15 years time. Mm. I mean, LED has a long shelf life, but it is gonna go out at some point. Yeah. So we have to think about that. And it's important to me that my products have longevity, mm. you know? I don't want, they should be kept. Yeah, no, completely. Um, and do you think, I mean, obviously with the decanter lights and the crystal, it was very, had a very British, traditional British aesthetic, I suppose, to start with. Do you feel your products have become more global in, look as as the companies become more global yeah maybe mm. i mean i mean it was british initially because mm. uh, all of the manufacturers that i were using were all mm. from britain initially yeah. because I, I i couldn't afford to be traveling to various parts of europe or india or the far east or wherever mm. um and then as the company grew we started to make products where the kind of original source was. So the Ital marble is in Italy, the crystal is in the Czech Republic, mm. the LEDs are made in the Far East. Um, 
and now, of course, everything's kind of then made again in the in the UK. Mm. But I th I think that you know we are we have become a global brand now. Yeah. Um, that the UK is isn't our biggest market. Mm -hmm. There are other markets outside of the UK yeah. that are much bigger for us. And I do a lot of travel and I consider myself to be a, a global citizen yeah. so in completely. that respect. Um, I think that's it's kind of like a, a nice way to be, not just be homogenized in the UK, no. although I'm very proud to be British mm. and, and what we have here. Yeah. Um, and I will always keep the company here, but mm. probably I'm sure that does reflect to the design to, mm. to some extent, because yeah. as I develop as an individual and as a designer, mm. so does the brand. The two kind of elements yeah. go hand in hand, so I think. Yeah, so I think it's a good time to obviously to draw on, to talk about the products that you've launched this year, which has been obviously of the last two years, very hard time to launch product because obviously yeah. during the pandemic, but obviously a lot of it refers to New York where you've just done an amazing project, which is yeah. creating a, an apartment, a full apartment, a leaf room apartment. Yeah. Um, can you tell us how that came about and what that, you know, talk about some of the products? Yeah, well, we had um, a showroom in Soho in New York mm. for a few years and um, we had a beautiful storefront, but quite a small space, compact yeah. space. And um, our lease was finished, so we were thinking about a new space to open. Mm. And uh, we do a lot of business in the States and in New York, so I was kind of tired of staying in hotels and Airbnbs, and then I kind of had this idea, why don't we kind of have an apartment that showcases mm -hmm. all the products? We can have more space to show them in and then it can be somewhere that I live when yeah. we're in New York. And then that kind of, um, that's a good thing about running mm. your own business. You can make these sort of yeah. avant-garde decisions yeah. sometimes. <laughs> but um, so, that was so you wanted it to be a functional living space, didn't you, not just a show abs home? Absolutely, yeah. I think uh, the exciting thing for me is, is that people who are gonna visit mm. are gonna get an open house experience. They're gonna mm. kind of see how the designer lives and how I, see my products within my own mm. space or that particular building. I wanted it to, I wanted people to feel when they come in like a sense of excitement, like they're getting a, a sneaky sort of glimpse into another world that you just wouldn't get walking into a, a showroom off the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, we got the place in January 2020 and we were midway through refurbishing it in March and mm. then had to down tools, pack up, come back to the UK, thinking, oh, I'll mm. be back there in two months. Yeah. And then 16 months later, yeah, kind of finally visited there for the first mm. time about five weeks ago. Yeah. But we completed the project virtually. I was gonna say, that's yeah. quite challenging doing it all remotely. Well, I was adopted. really opposed to the idea. Mm. I was just like, there's no way uh, as an interior designer that particularly when it comes to the styling, the pos you know, positioning of the vase and foliage mm. and just all of that kind of detail that you need to be present at. And then fast forward three weeks and I was on New York time on yeah. WhatsApp telling people where to put paintings, where to put yeah. sculptures. Um, what I actually did was I got my visualizer to create visuals for every single room, mm. but every single item in all of the rooms yeah. down to the, I, fortunately I got photographs for the inventory of everything. So every painting, every sculpture, mm. every book, he visualized and I literally did it virtually. Mm. Um, and initially I did it for the photo shoot because I thought we're gonna need to photograph it first. Yeah. So we'd place things in positions and the stylist who I got to, to help mm. me there would be like, you're gonna bump into this table. I'm like, it doesn't matter, that's gonna be a photograph. Yes, it's how it looks. And then the second iteration mm. was then making it livable. And mm. then we did another design scheme where it was kind of had a nice flow and you could walk around. Mm. So seeing it for the first time was a very surreal experience yeah. for me. But it's yeah. great, and we obviously featured it on the cover of our May issue this yeah. year, which is obviously, which is great. so I can attest to how beautiful it is. Um, and you know, obviously the new product that forms part of that apartment ha is called, you obviously have the White Street sofa, the Tribeca tables. Um, it's obviously, it's in, you know, it's grounded in New York. Yeah. Was that part of what you were thinking when you were creating those products? Yeah, I mean, I, when we got into this space, obviously I'm known a lot more for lighting. Mm. We've always designed furniture, yeah. but obviously we're known for lighting. But I hadn't 
released a sofa since 2011 and I was in this space and I was like, right, okay, I'm not going to put somebody else's sofa in here. I need to like mm. just get on with it and like do it. Yeah. And it was quite nice because it was, you know, for the first time I had a very strict brief, you know, which was it had to fit within the footprint of the room. The sort of finishes had to work. They had, you know, I was very much inspired by the environment outside mm. of the building, the sort of cast iron building. It's a very also a very brutalist tower mm. skyscraper that's just outside. And these details through these large windows really informed the design scope for the tables and, and the mm. sofa pieces. Fantastic. Um, and obviously, I'd like to talk to you about the, the latest thing you've launched, which is obviously during London Design Festival, you launched Candles, which is, mm. and it's kind of an interesting thing. Obviously, you've been around for, since 2007. Why is it taking you so long to do Candles? Lots of design brands do them. What was the what's the thinking behind that? Well, I, I think it goes back to that thing of sort of being a perfectionist. I had so many people ask me all the time, like, are you going to do a candle collection? Mm. You know, people are obsessed with scented candles. Mm. And, you know, I am as well. Mm. But I just I was just so kind of nervous that I didn't want to create anything that was just token, that I would sort of just create, slap a label on it, and mm. here you go, that's it. I think if I'm going to do this, it has to have a point of difference. So I started designing it around three years ago, yeah. and then I'd put it on the shelf and I'd leave it, and then I'd come back to it and change it. And then mm. eventually the, the current iteration of it was the one that I was really happy with, which is essentially creating a permanent object, yeah. which is like a solid crystal, optical crystal container that has the scent which you sort of slot in, which mm. has a different finish in gold mm. or gunmetal. And then once the candle is extinguished, you can then buy another refill and another scent mm. and put it in. So, and over the years, we'll start to develop more and more. So mm. in your own home, it kind of changes and, and develops and mm. there's more of a, a permanence about it as well. Yeah, I think that, and again, that talks that idea of sustainability and things you keep and it's not just completely throw away. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, the kind of recyclability, the, you know, the, mm. the wax is soy wax, it's biodegradable, and then you have this beautiful permanent object as well. So. Mm. Um, much like the crystal bulb is permanent, yeah. you know, you unscrew that, you change the LED, and then you mm. sort of screw it back on. You yeah. know? So that, uh, that's so important, I think, yeah, in I design. Yeah, I think that idea of sustainability is obviously one of the issues affecting designers most going into the future. So yeah. it's great that you're thinking about that as, as part of what you do. Well, uh, I mean, you just we have a responsibility to do it as designers. Mm. Uh, well, as human beings, we have a responsibility to think sustainably. Mm. but. You know, 15 years ago, there was sort of two camps of designers. You had the eco designer mm. and then other designers, and now they're homogenized. You know, from the inception of an idea when I'm working, we are thinking about the sustainability. That's mm. the most important time to think about it. Yeah, is from the from the beginning of your of your idea, and mm. also we're creating products that we want people to keep for the rest of yeah. their lives, passed down to generations. Mm. And I have a responsibility not to release rubbish yeah. or things that people don't want. You no. know, it's it's got to be, you know, credible things that mm. have uniqueness, that have a point of difference, either in their function or their aesthetic. Mm -hmm. There's still room for beauty in the world. We shouldn't stop creating, but mm. we have to be responsible for sure. No, completely. Um, what what role do you think collaboration will play in the future? You've obviously done a lot of interesting um, collaborations in the past. Do you think collaboration is important for for my brand? Yeah, or, or yeah. for your brand, or for you know just generally? I think you think yeah. people should collaborate more going forward. You know. I mean, I th I think it creates a different point of difference. Mm. I mean, when I'm designing for my own brand, it's it's really a blank canvas, and you think that sounds liberating, mm. but you know you have to remember that designers like working around restrictions. Yeah. That's how we work most effectively. Solving problems. Or yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Mm. So I'm kind of having to throw restrictions in there where there weren't any in the first place mm. and then sort of create my own brief. When I work with another brand, let's say for Wedgwood, um, mm. we've, I very much had a brief. We want you to work in Jasperware, we want you to visit the archives, which is one of the main mm. reasons why I wanted to yeah. do the project. 
Um, and immediately you're immersed into their world and it's my job to sort of like combine my design aesthetic with their heritage and create something hopefully that is different for them and also different for, for me. Yeah. It pushes your brain into another area as a designer, mm. which is, is always really you know, rewarding, I think. Mm. And what are your plans for the brand going forward? I know we, we've discussed obviously you'll be showing in Milan in 22, next, yes. uh, next, next April, so yeah. you're working towards that. What other places do you want to take the brand to in the future? Um, I mean, we're going to continue to do lots more lighting and furniture mm -hmm. and accessories. Um, there are other things that I would like to create and design, mm. maybe for myself, kind of perhaps more around technology, but also for other mm. brands as well. Yeah. Um, another important thing for us as well is that I would like to kind of increase our sort of manufacturing capability as a brand mm. to mm. kind of you know, go one step beyond the assembly and more into manufacture and sort mm. of bring that home, if you if you like, yeah. to, to really get full control over every aspect of, of what we do. Mm. And, and then to design things that I've not designed before. I mean, I mm. think, you know, yeah. personally, the reason why I, I love what I do is because I love design, you mm. know? Um, and I love manifesting things that yeah. are in my head. Mm -hmm. So um, there are lots of things that I haven't designed yet that I would like to. Fantastic. And going back to this idea of Milan, you've always done these incredible installations and presentations. Obviously, like we said before, with the apartment in New York, the way you present your designs to the public, to clients, to the press, has always been a very important part of what you do. Do you think there's still a, a relevant um, relevance for these big international design fairs? Well, I mean, we'll see next year. Mm. I mean, I th th there's certainly an appetite for it. Yeah. People want to sort of interact in the way that we're doing here, yeah. you know? I mean, this is like one of the first design shows I've been to, and mm. it, you know, since, you know, the pandemic. So mm. there is an appetite for it. Mm. I have to say, though, I mean, uh, one of the most exciting projects that I did was during the pandemic, and that was for the launch of our chair. And we mm. did the film Maestro and yeah. presented it with an orchestra, a four-minute film. And I just thought it was an opportunity for designers to go, right, let's do mm. something completely different. We don't have to stick to this formula. We can present mm. things in different ways. And I was surprised, actually, that more designers didn't do the same. In fashion, they certainly yes, did. Absolutely. Um, but I, we're starting to see a few other brands have actually just started to release films mm. like Demore and Apparatus. Mm. And it's, it's really beautiful to see because, you know, it's a different medium. It's a different form of beauty. Yeah. And you have to kind of push the envelope a bit. And mm. for me, I got to become a film director, yeah. you know. So it's like in doing this like for 14 years to get the opportunity to do something different mm. is, is really important. Yeah. So if you haven't seen the film, you have to watch it on our yeah. Vimeo page because it is really... Yeah, um, it's the Musico it's chair, isn't it? Yes, which is yeah. Just, yeah, which is yeah. based all around the shape of a violin. So yes, yeah. exactly. Great. Um, and, um, yeah, I think kind of... You've obviously always been driven by this, I think we talked about it before, the fear of mediocrity. You know, it's that kind of... Yeah. What, does, what other things drive you? Hmm. That's a good question. Yes, definitely m mediocrity yeah. does drive me. Mm. I, I hate the idea of, of that. Mm. Um, I, I, I mean, I really think creating, it's almost like, a, oh God, it sounds really macabre to say it like this, but it's almost like an illness. You know, it's sort of mm. like, it's there in my head all the time, mm. design, and I'm sort of envisaging lots of ideas. And it's one thing having something in your head, actually creating something in reality from that. For me, it's almost like a personal goal. Mm. How exacting can I get it to what's in my head, mm. you know? And to create experiences for people as well and to sort of bring pleasure to people. I still get a massive kick out of somebody who purchases one of our products, yeah. you know? It still kind of like blows my mind in a way, mm. you know? It's yeah. like very proud of that and very proud that somebody would invest in, in what we're doing as a whole company and yeah. what I'm doing as a designer. Yeah. So I, I think that's the kind of thrill for me. That's, yeah. that's what motivates no, me. No, I think that's and that's I think that's apparent. You get that sense from it, which is great. But thank you very much. It's been great talking to you and thank you. learning it's more about it. I look forward to seeing what you do in the future. Thank um, you. We've now got a little kind of five minutes for, a, for any questions. So anyone got any questions at all? 
Hello, Lee. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you, because as you told the story of Vivian Westwood, what he did for you, it's the same thing what you did for me. I worked for you as an intern, which gave me opportunity to to know how you run your business, how you dedicate your work, and how everyone works around you. I would like to say thank you. Oh, you're uh, welcome. And I also wanted to ask you, as I start my own brand, and is it's pretty challenging to get your design across into the public. And I wanted to ask you, for the first time when you decided to move from interior design with your partner, your business partner, and then you start designing your product, how did you get your product out there so people can see how talented and how great your design is? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's difficult. I mean, for me, it was all about kind of, first of all, finding a platform to release your collection. And um, we, we started ours in the London Design Festival, which is a really great platform. But it was my ambition at that point to sort of show, not necessarily a traditional trade show, but to show in galleries during those design weeks, which in a way meant that we kind of lost out on so many people coming to see the show. But at the same time, it gave me a sort of point of difference, almost like a sort of bravery to what we were doing. Um, and so whoever did come really engaged in, in what I was creating. Mm. Um, I think that the, in terms of like sustaining that is the really difficult thing. Um, I did still do the interiors and I was doing the interior projects for many years before the products actually started really taking off financially. And I say this to all designers, you have to be multidisciplinary when you start. Unfortunately, you can't just do one thing, particularly if you wanna design and make your own products and be an entrepreneur. You have to be doing something else to support that at the same time, whether it's working with other brands, collaborating with other brands, doing interiors, doing something completely different creatively, but you need to have a few strings to your bow and then at the same time, just keep your eye on the prize. I think every decision that you will make, if you know where you want to go, will take you in the right direction. And any door that opens, you'll be able to see them a lot more clearly if you have real focus on, on where you want to end up, at least in the next five years, let's say. That's great, great advice. Um, uh, another question, thank you. So sit your front. Hello. Hi. Um, when you first started in particular, um, how could you be sure that your designs weren't copied by Asia, for example, where they could um, recreate your designs at a fraction of the price? Well, I mean, I wasn't really thinking about that when we first started because I guess, you know, I was just focused on creating products. And we probably weren't as well known then for anybody to replicate what we were doing. Now, of course, that's massively changed. And unfortunately, the, the culture of, of um, replicas is mm. very much there. And it's a really difficult thing to kind of fight. If we, if we did fight every single case, it would be a full-time job, unfortunately. So you can't. So occasionally, we tried to make an example of you know, a company that's doing it, and we do sort of send out letters, and you have to have registration over the actual products that you're designing, but it is really, really hard, and particularly if you're a young designer, to, um, to kind of pay for registration for copyright on your product is incredibly expensive, and you've got to do it for different markets, and it's, it's just unfortunately one of those things that you kind of I know you have to sort of suck up. I mean, it's in, until mm. the kind of general culture around it, it changes. Yeah, now, I don't unfortunately have the kind of magical answer for people mm. in kind of how to, how to solve that problem. Um, but it really started happening for us from the point when we released all the crystal collections. Um, and from then on, it's happened ever since, so. pieces of crystal how can you prevent someone copying that because that anyone can go yeah. to a market and buy crystals yeah well we couldn't do anything about the decanter light because it's although it was an original design it's not actually an original design mm. we didn't design the decanters 
the crystal bulb was different. You know, we we uh, we copyrighted that product, and anybody that does decide to to do a Lee Broom replica of that, then we do send a nasty letter, um, or our IP lawyers do. Mm. Um, but yes, it depends. I mean, there is nothing you can do. I mean, it. it it's a double-edged sword because you wouldn't be copied if you weren't popular. That's mm. the thing. But the culture needs to change, I think. And there have been some improvements in that over yeah. the years. But there are certain countries that sort of have very different rules. That and, and, and that's the problem. Yeah. Anyone else? I think that's it. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. And um, thank you, Lee. Thank you.